In this video, we will look at the Baron Cohen et al. study on the eyes test used to measure the social impairment of people who are diagnosed with either autism or Asperger syndrome. Nowadays, we really don't distinguish between Asperger and autism because they're now considered to be uh, a spectrum disorder in the DSM-5 uh, Diagnostical Statistical Manual uh, that's used by psychologists. Uh, but when the study was written, it was 2001, so we will mostly refer to the um, 2001 context of having two uh, separate diagnoses. Um, this study does deal with autism, and we will briefly go over what autism is uh, in case you're not familiar with the condition. Okay, so let's start with what is autism. Um, and that symbol there, the jigsaw puzzle piece, is commonly used to represent people who are diagnosed or want to spread awareness uh, for uh, autism. I believe this symbol was chosen because it represents the enigmatic quality uh, behind uh, the causes of autism. To this day, we really have no definitive genetic or environmental um, links uh, to autism. There's too much controversy about what is the cause. However, um, a lot of people didn't like the puzzle piece because it might have indicated that autistic people are missing something. Uh, but it's since been you know, appropriated to mean it's a complex uh, condition, and also it goes along with some of the interests that autistic people have. They tend to be interested in things that are, um, what's the word for it, things that come in pieces. What I mean by that is things like engineering or things that have parts or some sort of, uh, they like to break things down into their core element parts. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but hopefully later that will make sense with some examples. Um, in the 80s, it was not um, a household word until um, the movie Rain Man. I believe it was from 1988. I had seen this movie in the theater with my parents, and even back then, I didn't understand autism because you know I thought I thought they said he was artistic, not autistic. And I watched this movie thinking I don't think he's very artistic. Um, I thought it was gonna be about a painter. Um, my surprise was that it was about a person who has some sort of severe social um, malfunction. So um, if you haven't seen the movie Rain Man, check it out. I think it um, does a pretty representative job of what people believe autism to uh, look like. As I said earlier, this is two, uh, 2001, so it's going to fall within the time frame for the DSM-4. And again, there are two separate um, diagnoses. And it was rec recognized that these are probably you know, extreme levels of the same uh, cognitive condition. However, nowadays we put it on a spectrum. So Asperger is no longer um, a, a recognized um, diagnosis. Okay, so let's look at that book a little bit more closely and you could pause this and look at it in your own time, but you can see there's a lot of overlap. Um, you know, just the first uh, diagnostic criteria seems to be cut and paste word for word. Um, so just to read uh, verbatim uh, some of this, um, marked impairment in the use of multiple nonverbal behaviors such as eye-to-eye -eye gaze, facial expression, body postures, and gestures to regulate social interaction. You know, think about your social interactions, how much is said or conveyed between two people without actually using spoken language. I, I've had uh, students who have been diagnosed with Asperger and autism in the past, and you know, you have to be careful using things like sarcasm around them because things are very uh, literal. Uh, so the tone of your voice, for example, should indicate to the person that perhaps you're being um, sarcastic, um, but that will be lost perhaps on a person who um, is um, under this spectrum. Uh, where the two really differentiate, however, is um, perhaps in uh, spoken language. Uh, autistic people tend to have a, a more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They tend to be more uh, quiet uh, or at least delayed in their development of spoken, uh, spoken language. And I, the best way to um, give examples of this without, uh, you know, using real real life examples is I would actually just look at an episode of The Big Bang Theory um, and look at some of the things that Sheldon does, uh, the, the interest in trains, for example, or the inability to get sarcasm. Um, those kind of things are um, quite uh, common with people with Asperger. Now, that being said, uh, there is a slight controversy about, you know, whether Sheldon Cooper or not is indeed uh having Asperger's syndrome, and I've actually read some articles where some people are actually offended that this show is um, using this condition for comedy. 
Um, but you know, that, that might be a minority of people. It's still a well rated show. All right. So the prevalence of autism is, um, higher than it used to be. And some people think that, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more common and, and that's why they're looking at sort of like, uh, technological possibilities for its cause. For, ex for example, maybe an increase in power lines and transformers or things like that. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily true. What I think is true, however, is not so much that people uh, are, are more and more likely to be diagnosed, uh, uh, sorry, more and more likely to be autistic. I think it's more likely that we have more knowledge about what it is. And therefore, with more knowledge comes more diagnosis. So if you ever look at statistics of uh, diagnoses, they tend to go up as time goes on. That's probably due to just, again, awareness of the condition. Uh, parents are much more aware of the possibilities of why their son or daughter is not succeeding uh, socially in school or something like that. So let's get into the star of the show. He is Simon Baron Cohn, and I know a lot of students recognize the name Baron Cohn from Sasha Baron Cohn, and indeed, I believe they are first cousins. Um, and both uh, the actor, comedian Sasha Baron Cohen and Simon Baron Cohen are associated with Cambridge. I know Sasha Baron Cohen, um, despite some of his characters who seem silly, uh, he's quite smart and did indeed go to Cambridge University. That being said, um, let's get to the, the man that we're talking about, and that's Simon Baron Cohen. Uh, he's considered to be um, one of the, the lead authorities on autism, and you could watch several videos on YouTube where he talks at length about his research. He's done several um, papers on the condition, um, neurological and cognitive. And, um, you know, he's still a professor and he believes that um, autistic people, this is where he differentiates or where he sort of um, makes his mark. He, he came up with this term called theory of mind. And that's, be, uh, that's to illustrate the idea that we could actually um, put ourselves in other people's shoes. And he thinks that autistic people have uh, mind blindness, uh, which is meaning you don't have that empathetic skill of theory of mind, being able to attribute mental states to yourself or to other people. And we'll get to a better definition or a slowed down definition in just a few moments. Uh, but to test this in the mid 80s, he came up with a test called uh, the Sally Ann test. And this test surprisingly um, works in, in, in differentiating autistic people from non-autistics. And how it works is you present uh, usually a child with uh, two dolls. Uh, maybe they have some distinguishing feature like different colored hair or dress, uh, and you give them names. One is Sally, one is Anne. And you see uh, one of the dolls puts a ball in a basket, and then she goes away, while naughty Anne um, decides to play a little trick and move the ball into the box instead. So when Sally comes back, where should she look for the ball? When she left, it was in the basket. So obviously, for most people watching this video, you would say, oh, she would look in the basket. However, an autistic uh, child might say she should look in the box. Um, so that's, again, the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. You know, we have this ability, uh, of, we use this ability a lot when we watch movies. We would not be scared or, or delighted if we didn't have some sort of empathetic skill to put ourselves in the character's shoes. Um, so this is lacking. If you want to watch a video of the Sally Ann test, there are several examples floating around on YouTube. But but that's older stuff. Let's get to the newer stuff. Um, Simon Baron Cohen, I should also say, is somewhat of a controversial figure because he has said several times that autism can be considered an extreme of the normal male profile. It's extreme maleness is another way of putting it. And I think what he meant by that, um, he has done tests on testosterone and, and biochemical things, but he's also, you know, he's not quite wrong because we associate certain hobbies with certain, uh, with the male gender, for example, uh, maybe an interest in engineering or parts. Um, you know, it may seem sexist to say things like this, but, you know, the, most of the people, uh, at least in the 20th century, who got into engineering and stuff of that nature uh, tend to be male. So... Uh, interest in things like uh, war gaming, strategic gaming, um, like I said earlier, Sheldon's interest in trains, uh, these tend to be associated with a male profile. Um, but, you know, of course, nowadays, uh, it's very uh, dangerous to have like a very binary or, or traditional view of gender. And so um, he got a lot of flack uh, for these claims. So um, here's an example from, I forget what, what publication this is, um, a bogus new autism study claims excessive maleness 
or manliness is to blame. And there you see a guy lifting, you know, a heavy weight. I don't think that's what Baron Cohen quite meant, um, but that's the way it sounds to people. Like I said, it's very controversial nowadays to make gender distinctions, especially in the West, uh, Western Hemisphere. I know the president of Harvard about 15 years ago got fired for suggesting that there were cognitive differences between males and females, and he was uh, forced to go on sort of an apology tour, uh, but it didn't help his, uh, his career as president of Harvard. All right, and here's another article. So this is some of the background stuff. Let's actually get to the study itself. So the big term for this study is theory of mind, and this is taken from the introduction of the primary source. Theory of mind is shorthand for the ability to attribute mental states to oneself or another person. And you can see in the parentheses that uh, one of the sources for this idea of theory of mind uh, is David Premack, who, um, if you looked at the uh, Parrot study, the Pepperberg Parrot study is actually referred to as well uh, for his study on um, arbitrary language with uh, chimpanzees. So David Premack is uh, mentioned in two background pieces uh, for the Cambridge syllabus. So that's pretty interesting to, to note. Um, anyway, moving forward. Um, he also refers to uh, the notion of theory of mind, Baron Cohen does, as uh, other terms such as mentalizing or mind reading coming from other uh, psychologists. Uh, and he also mentions that it overlaps with the term empathy. Um, so that's an easier way to describe theory of mind. They're not quite perfect synonyms, but they are quite similar. Um, if you don't know the difference between empathy and sympathy, I think they're used uh, mistakenly, interchangeably uh, a great deal in our common conversations. There is a difference. Uh, empathy is, again, putting yourself in someone else's uh, shoes. It's, while uh, sympathy is more a, of a signal that you recognize the other person's mental state, um, so you're, you're letting it be known that you're aware of the other person's uh, stressful situation. And uh, these, this goes along with the notion of maybe compassion and pity. Um, there are two types of empathy. Uh, I don't think you need to know this, but if you want to know it, uh, you're welcome to. This is something I save usually for A-level psychology. Uh, but essentially, the difference between cognitive empathy and effective empathy is sort of just um, recognizing something, and then the effective empathy is doing something. So, for example, your friend walks in, and you could see there's some lines in his brow, and he doesn't look quite right. And so um, you feel, you know, you, you're stressed because your friend is stressed a little bit and you recognize his state. Uh, the effect of empathy is when you say something like, hey, man, what's wrong? And then he tells you and then maybe you help him out. Um, so cognitive empathy is, is more internal. Effective empathy is more of an external expression. Um, again, maybe we're getting a little bit off the main script here, but why not throw it in? All right, let's get to the aims. There are three aims in this study. Uh, the first aim, the main aim, is to see if we can create some sort of test, either a paper test or a computer test, that could uh, assess social impairment. Is there a good way to measure a person's lack of theory of mind? Is there a gauge for mind blindness? And we're going to use a test that uses pictures of people's eyes only. Uh, no nose, no mouth, or uh, much else. So we're going to try to attribute mental states to people just based on their eyes. And um, we'll talk about that later. Uh, the second aim is to see if AQ, which stands for Autism Quotient, uh, has an inverse correlation with an eyes test. So an easy way to say this is the more autistic you are, the less likely you are to recognize other people's emotions. That's a very simplified way, but that's really what it's saying. Um, AQ, again, is Autism Quotient. Uh, please know that acronym. Um, you know, IQ, intelligence quotient, EQ, emotional quotient, and now we have AQ, autism quotient. And we're going to throw in a third aim while we're at it. We have the data. We might as well do this as well. We want to see if females have better theory of mind than males. Uh, maybe it's a bit of a stereotype or a cliche, but there is a belief that women um, are more emotionally intelligent than men. So let's test that and see if there's any truth to that claim. All right, a big part of the study is the apparatus. We gotta spend a lot of time talking about the apparatus because that's really the, uh, the focus. Does this uh, new test work? So there is an old apparatus that was used in a 1997 study, uh, but Baron Cohn and his colleagues weren't very happy 
with how it was constructed, nor were they very happy with the results. Uh, and part of the reason was the test was perhaps too easy, as well as having other flaws. There are many flaws to this test. One of the biggest being that you could see here for each set of eyes, there are only two choices. Uh, and as you know from maybe taking true or false tests in your class, uh, that gives you a great opportunity to just guess right. Um, so that's the odds are, are way too um, good. Uh, so the fourth choice was 50-50. Uh, in the new test, we're going to clean that up by having it be 25%, uh, having four choices. Uh, there was not a huge difference between those diagnosed with autism and those who were not in terms of the results, and therefore it's really not showing us much of anything. And in some cases, there's no examples here, there were some opposites used between the terms, so that would be also too easy. For example, the words sympathetic and unsympathetic were used for one of the sets of eyes. Um, most of the female, uh, most of the faces were female, so a gender imbalance. Uh, there was no glossary for people, so here I think none of these words should be, you know, SAT type words or very difficult type words, um, but you never know. Uh, so there's no way to provide meaning where someone doesn't have any. And again, uh, some were just way too easy. And this leads to what's called a ceiling effect in our results. We'll come back to that term later. Uh, you might need to know that term. Uh, several students a few years ago were surprised when they were asked about the ceiling effect in the 1997 Baron Cohn uh, study on one of the Cambridge exams. So you never know what's going to be asked, so might as well know it. Uh, also interesting to note is the old test also had uh, mouth uh, expressions, and um, we're not going to talk too much about this, but I just wanted to put this up here because I'm having a really, really hard time with the first one. Is the first one flirting? Or is it happy? Um, to me, uh, in my limited experience, it could be kind of both. Um, so if you have an opinion, I'd, I'd love to know, uh, maybe in the comments, is this flirting or is this happy? Um, this is, could also be gender dependent too. Um, it's not really a great question, I think. All right, so let's come back to the ceiling effect. What is a ceiling effect? It is what it sounds like. Um, when you have two variables, um, this is not from the study. This is just a random image of the ceiling effect. Um, you don't really see a measurable difference between the two independent groups or the control group and the treatment group if you're doing drugs. Uh, and therefore, the data doesn't really reveal any meaning. So it, it tops out. So for example, let's say I gave everyone a psychology test that was really way too easy. And, it, you know, so that students who usually get E's are getting A's and students who get A's are also getting A's. It's really not a really good test. When you make a test, you want to have measurable differences. Otherwise, it's not a very effective test. So if I gave you a psych test that said, um, question one, psychology is the study of A, the mind, B, uh, the foot, C, the sky, or D, robots, um, you know, you're going to have a really terrible uh, ceiling effect. All right, so now we got to make a better test. We need what's called the revised eyes test. So when you refer to the eyes test, you could throw in the word revised there. Like I said before, now we have a 25% chance if we were to guess, uh, because now there are four adjectives around each set of eyes. And now we've also fixed this um, by having a glossary. Let me, let me actually just uh, ask you, if you haven't taken the real eyes test, it's uh, readily available online. I will post the link uh, right below this video or in the description notes of this video. So I invite you, it's not terribly long, it's uh, 36 uh, sets of eyes, just like the, the one that was given. It's exactly the one that was given, actually. Um, and actually, the, the sets of eyes, interesting to note, come from magazines. Uh, they're not models that were just for the study, uh, so you might actually recognize some um, models or celebrities in those images. I'm not sure why they did that. Maybe it had something to do with um, you know, just being quick uh, rather than having the professional photographer come in uh, to do that. Oh, and another thing is uh, it's now gender balanced. 18 male, 18 female, I believe. All right, so there is a glossary. Uh, here is the first uh, few words from that glossary. Some of them are SAT worthy, some of them are not. I know a lot of students, for example, um, have a hard time with words like aghast. Actually, I cut off that word, where is aghast? Um, contemplative, um, maybe some words escape 
uh, the people taking this test. So now we have a glossary to help them along. Um, here are nine of the 36 uh, images. I think the first one was just a sample. I'm not sure if that one was actually used. Um, but again, you could pause the video and try to see how well you would do. I'm going to put the answers up in just a few moments uh, if you would like to uh, assess yourself based on nine of the images. Okay, here are the answers. Okay. Um, we have to know how this was created, actually, because that's important in, in uh, determining if it's a valid test as well. Oh, or I'm, if, I'm sorry, if it's reliable. Um, the eyes test development involved eight judges. Uh, four of them were male, four of them were female. In order for a candidate question to be accepted, we must have a majority of these people agree on the word. So what does that mean? So let's say this was the uh, sample picture and we're putting this in its sort of uh, beta testing. Uh, we want to see if the target word is chosen by five. In this case, you could see five check marks. They all said reflective. And some of the other people chose different ones. They, one chose impatient, one chose irritated, and another one also chose impatient. So therefore, we're going to accept this as a usable question for the eyes test. The other apparatus that was created by Baron Cohn is something called the Autism Quotient, and I think this is also available online if you want to look for it. This is just a sample of the first 10 items in the AQ test, and you can see it is a four-point Likert or Likert scale, depending on your pronunciation, uh, that ranges from definitely agree to definitely disagree. And this kind of gauges uh, someone's everyday social practices or um, things that people notice or habits and things like that. So if you look at the DSM uh, criteria for diagnosis, one of the things is repetitive behaviors. And number two are, is I prefer to do things the same way over and over again. And I think a lot of us will definitely agree with this. Uh, but remember, it's, it's, a, it's a longer test than just this. So one item is not going to put you in the autistic category. It's got to be a combination of things. All right, so now that we have the two main apparatuses, uh, we can move on to procedure. But let me just, oh, let me just say that this here at the bottom. Participants who are already diagnosed with uh, high-functioning autism or, or Asperger syndrome did not have to take this. They were already diagnosed, so that there was no need to do it, um, they, or they already had that data already. Um, so keep that in mind. What else did I want to say about that? All right, let's, let's move forward to the procedure. It takes place at a, a room in Cambridge or Exeter. Okay, we might as well use what's available to us since Baron Cohen does work there. Uh, there were four groups of people, and I think this is where the study gets difficult for people, is keeping track of those four groups. And this is both independent groups design and matched pairs, and that's another reason why it uh, causes some problems. All right, um, I'm not going to read anything else here. If you want to pause it, you're welcome to do so. This is the primary source. Let's get into the participants, and here's how they're broken down in table one of the primary source. Uh, group one are the uh, diagnosed, okay, Asperger and high-functioning autism. Uh, group two, general population controls. Group three are students, and group four is where the matched pairs comes in. They are matched for IQ, and that's a way to control for extraneous uh, variables. Let me give you a pictorial representation of these four groups. Uh, so group four is IQ matched, and um, I have to actually look here at the source to see what the IQ scores were. This has been asked about before, and I always forget. Was it 116? Yeah, so that's 116. Uh, so group four had a uh, mean IQ score of 116, while group one had a mean IQ score of 115, which is kind of interesting because in both groups, they're well above the average. An average IQ test uh, score should be 100. Um, and that's important to keep in mind too when thinking about autistic people is that they're not they're not mentally impaired in terms of their ability to um, calculate and do uh, incredibly abstract things sometimes. Um, as for the other groups, uh, I don't believe their IQ was actually uh, given. Um, that would have been probably too time consuming and maybe unnecessary. Uh, so the word there is normal for both groups. Group two, normal adults. Group three, normal adult students. Uh, and both of these groups were captured, uh, not captured, uh, they were found through opportunity uh, sampling. Um, so the 
normal adults were found in like a public library, uh, either in Cambridge or Exeter, and the adult students would, uh, of course, come from Cambridge University if they're adult students. Okay, so, so those are the groups, and um, the results will be rather lengthy because there are so many groups uh, in this study. And uh, you can see the numbers are quite high for the controls, uh, 155 for normal adults, 103 for the students. Um, group 4, actually, I don't put the number there, but it's actually 14 adults. I should mention that on, on the graphic. All right, uh, moving forward. Uh, let's get into those results, and actually, uh, we'll do something a little different. We'll just look at the predictions because every prediction winds up being uh, proven uh, with the results. So, for example, the first prediction is that the autism and the uh, Asperger group would score significantly lower on the mental state judgments of the eyes test. Uh, and oh, as far as the other part of that statement, be unimpaired on the gender control judgments. Uh, they were also asked to judge whether the eyes were coming from a male or a female, and that was just to see if there was some sort of severe other type of impairment going on besides just social impairment. Maybe there's even some visual impairment. Uh, and sure enough, that uh, prediction uh, wound up being true. Uh, sure enough, the autistic people uh, scored significantly higher on the AQ. That's to be expected. Uh, females did indeed score higher than males uh, in the control groups or the normal groups, excuse me. Um, so that's there. Uh, males in the normal group would score higher than females on the AQ. Um, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Uh, remember what Baron Cohen said is that he sees uh, autism as a kind of like an extreme maleness. Um, so that checks out. And scores on the AQ and the eyes test would be inversely correlated, and that will indeed be true. Uh, I'm a big fan of saying to students, don't get lost in the numbers, but it doesn't hurt to have simplified numbers. So let me give you some of those now based on the first prediction. Uh, the autism group would score significantly lower on the mental state judgments on the eyes test, and that's indeed proven or, or given mathematically as significantly uh, lower than the other groups. Uh, so the mean identification of correct uh, words for the eyes was 21.9. Uh, if you set on a Cambridge test, 22 out of 36, I, I don't think that would be a big deal. Um, so out of the 36 images, the average for correct uh, identification was 22. I know I've had students that got lower than that. Um, they're a little panicked about it. Uh, I know when I taught in China, some people got lower. <laughs> but I say, listen, it's, it's in another language. Uh, maybe that's part of the problem. You didn't look at the glossary close enough. Uh, don't panic uh, and self-diagnose based on this video. There's many ways to assess uh, this situation. Maybe you're having a, a low coffee day. Anyway, um, the group four people were the highest. Uh, so, you know, is there a relationship between IQ and the ability to attribute mental states? Well, not really, because we're only one point difference between group one and group Four. Remember, group four had an IQ average of 116, and group one had an average of 115. Uh, but it is interesting to note that um, they are the highest. Um, I'm not sure why that would be, what kind of theory you can come up with with why high IQ people were able to identify the words better. Maybe they just knew the words better. Uh, maybe some people didn't bother with the glossary. I don't know. Uh, as far as males versus females, uh, there's some data right there. So of the 53 male students, they had a mean of 27.3 versus females with 50 students, 28.6. And that doesn't look like a big gap. Um, 1.3 is not very huge in, in our eyes, but it is uh, mathematically significant. So it's not due to chance. So if you run uh, some sort of uh, statistical analysis on it, again, it proves the prediction that um, females will do better on the eyes test. Um, going to the uh, thing we talked about, about the inverse correlation between the AQ and the uh, eyes test, that turns out to be okay. Uh, if you want to know the uh, Pearson correlation coefficients, uh, which are calculated with the formula above, uh, the uh, correlation between AQ and eyes test was as expected uh, with a strong correlation of 0.53. Uh, if you want to know more about the value R, it could span anywhere from negative one to one, I believe. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a great statistician, uh, but the higher it is to one, the more likely it is to be uh, correlated. 
so they also ran this test on IQ and AQ and found no significant correlation uh, with uh, the values very, very small. Uh, the R value there being um, the Pearson coefficient value being 0 0.09. Um, again, not, not big on stats, but you know this is a way of showing that the inverse correlation is very carefully calculated and not just plotted randomly on a graph like um, we do in our school. All right, results were also broken down by the actual pictures themselves, uh, 1 through 36. I can't fit all 36 on this slide. I'm just showing a few examples. Um, this is way too many numbers, uh, but I find it interesting that, again, the IQ group uh, really rocked out on this test, uh, in some cases getting 100% for some of the pictures. Um, so while there is no relationship between IQ and um, social in intelligence in terms of telling what people are feeling, um, there is a, a better performance from the group four than with the other groups. And this is just uh, the main results that you'll see in the various textbooks and in the primary source. This is the actual primary source image. Uh, and I think it's good advice not to sweat this too much, all right? Get an idea of who's high and who's low for each thing. But in terms of numbers, if you want to you know, take that step, go ahead and do it. I personally don't do that. Um, I don't even know if, if you stop Baron Cohen on the street and you asked him uh, what was the uh, mean score for the general population controls that were female in the 2001 test you did on uh, the revised ICE test, I don't think Baron Cohen would be able to tell you what it is. Um, and I, I think that's a lot to expect. Uh, well, interesting to note, though, is that um, I find it interesting that it says in the notes that some students did not record or some of the people in the groups did not return their uh, AQ tests to the, to the examiners or to the experimenters. And um, that makes me feel better about myself because you would think that students from Cambridge would be much more um, responsible than that. Anyway, off topic. Going forward, uh, there is a big limitation to this study that uh, Baron Cohn points out, and that's pretty much dealing with the notion that we, when we look at people's faces, we usually don't try to do this sort of cognitive empathy with non-moving pictures. In other words, we usually are more likely to attribute mental states to people in real life that are dynamic and moving around. So there are two key words here in this criticism. They're static, which means not moving, and dynamic. And he suggests that maybe for a future study, either that he conducts or that somebody else conducts, uh, they may want to consider using dynamic stimuli. So, you know, one thing you could think about is would a dynamic ice test improve this study? Could you think of a way to make uh, a video version of the ice test or will that cause more problems? Uh, will it be harder to control, for example? These are the types of uh, things that usually like a paper two We'll look at um, taking something that you've already studied and trying to change it or make it better in some way. So speaking of this, let's get to the evaluation because um, that criticism of it being a static test goes directly with validity, in particular ecological validity. Uh, when you talk about ecological validity, it goes hand in hand with mundane realism. And you know, again, we're not asked to look at static images and attribute mental states. However, if my friend Jimmy walks in and he's got tears rolling down his face, I'm going to attribute a mental state. Whereas I'm flipping through a magazine, I'm not going to quite do it as often. So there is an issue with ecological validity. That being said though, I think other types of validity, um, like uh, construct validity, uh, is it measuring what the theory of autism is? Uh, does it match what all people believe autism actually is? And the AQ seems to be quite valid, and the ICE test seems to be quite valid, in judging uh, who is autistic and who may not be autistic. So validity is sort of like a, a middle of the road type of thing. Uh, eco is low, but in terms of other types of validity, I think it's quite high. And this is one of those studies that's kind of rare in our syllabus where a lot of things are high. Uh, generalizability is high because of the number of students. Now, of course, they're all from a similar region, so it's not exactly great. Uh, but it is a lot of people, hundreds of people. Reliability uh, controls are employed. Uh, there is uh, extraneous variables controlled for in the IQ test and things like that. Um, oh, let me jump back to generalizability. I just realized, though, that all the autistic uh, people uh, used in the study are male. 
So maybe that should go a little lower. It just dawned on me. Anyway, uh, application I think is high because these are tools that psychologists could use or that you could use yourself if you're worried about a friend or yourself having some sort of social impairment and they're readily available. Both the AQ and the ICE test are readily available online. So go find them if you'd like. And the ethics, I can't think of a single ethical problem. If, 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 that would be a good challenge. If you could think of anything that's ethically wrong with the study, I invite you to leave a comment. But I, I don't see a deception. Uh, I don't see any sort of uh, distress, all right? Having someone take a test, I know that students find this stressful, but it's really not um, you know, sticking you in a, in a box with a snake, all right? So um, I think this is quite a strong study. Uh, maybe it's one of the reasons why it stayed on the syllabus uh, from year to year to year because it is quite um, ethical and strong. All right, I'll just leave you with one past paper question. Um, there are tons online that you could look at. I just chose this one because you never know uh, what level of detail is required of you, and this is why I chose this particular question. Uh, it reads, Baron Cohen et al. ICE test provided a glossary of 93 words to help the participants to identify mental states. List four of these words. Now, the reason why I'm putting this up here is just to show you that please be prepared for anything, right? You might be asked about a ceiling effect. You might be asked about the flaws in the 97 test. You might be asked about uh, the IQ of the control group, uh, of the um, match groups. Uh, you never know. So detail could be important. Um, but like I said earlier, in terms of data details, you have to ask yourself, is it worth the mental effort uh, on that small chance that you'll be asked for a number for the Baron Cohen study? All right, guys, I hope this video was helpful. Um, I do think this is one of the most interesting studies that we've uh, had in the past couple of years, partly because I think autism awareness is something that is still on the rise and people are getting more and more curious about what is the possible cause or what is the actual, um, what are the actual symptoms of the disorder. Um, I shouldn't really call it a disorder. Um, some people will take offense to that. Um, let's call it a cognitive condition. All right, I'm sure that will make more people um, less angry. Okay, so I hope you have a good day.